Hello everyone, my name is David Berger. Welcome to my presentation on hashing and salting, the most delicious way to store one's passwords. All right. Quick overview, what is a hash? You know, what's a hash table, what's a hash function? Basically, um, it's a function that takes in an input and then it basically generates buckets, you know, memory addresses, whatever you wanted there. This is an example of a an extremely simple hash function here. Basically, we're going to take in a string. We're going to have a certain number of buckets. And in that string, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of the characters in that string, change them to numbers, add them all up, right? And then, based on the number of buckets, we're going to do a modular operation. And it's going to fall into one of those buckets. So in the example here, we have a string, Mary had a little LAN. We're going to put it into 14 buckets, and when we actually execute that function, it says, okay, Mary had a little land. That's going to go into bucket six. Okay, this is the most simple example that we can give. Why is this okay? Okay, why is it an okay example? Um, it's not the worst, really. Uh, it is indeed a function, which is great. It only has uh, one output for every input. That's great. Uh, that one on the top right there, is that a function? Can anyone tell me? Function or not a function? I'll come back to you. Max, I'm going to look for you on that. <laughs> all right. It has a defined range, all right? So we have a certain amount of buckets, right? And no matter what strings we put into that function, it's going to fall into one of those buckets. So that's good. We're not going to have infinite buckets. We know that there's only 14. It's continuous-ish. Um, so sometimes you want this in a hash function. Um, for example, if we were to change maybe just one letter of that string that we passed in, it might give us a similar hash. And a reason that we might want that is if we are doing something like searches, saying like, oh, this search is very close to this other search. Let's store them together, OK? And it can handle big inputs. Looking back on that example, you know, there was no li um, limit for the length of that string. No matter how long that string is going to be, we're not going to have a problem adding up all the character codes and then taking a modulo operation on that. That leads me to my next <coughs> point. It is not invertible, OK? So we have the number six here. The number six was the output of our hash, right? Does anyone remember what our hash was? What our input was? No, Mary had a little LAN, right? Is there any way to actually know that we input Mary had a little LAN just from the output of number six? No, there's not. In fact, based on that hash function that I showed you briefly, basically infinite inputs could also give us a hash of six. If I was very clever, I could probably get the entire works of Shakespeare to hash out to six, given that simple algorithm. So let's go over why it sucks. All right. So that hash function, it tends to non-uniformity. This is actually something interesting. You'd expect if we're just adding up random characters and then taking a modulo operation on them that they would fall into the buckets evenly. Turns out that doesn't happen. I did the, this for um, 50,000 random strings and put them into 59 buckets. And that's the sort of distribution that we get. So not very uniform. <clears throat> it is continuous. So for example, if I had Mary had a little lamb and that hashes to six, Mary had a little lamb hashes to five. Now that's a problem in the world of storing passwords because that would mean that we can sort of zero in on a hash. If we're looking to produce a certain hash, then we might know which direction to head in order to hit that hash. Collisions are very trivial to produce, mainly because this function is very small. And it is exploitable. It's too simple. If I wanted to devise an attack on this particular hashing algorithm in order to um, you know, produce collisions or other types of things that we're going to see a little bit later, that would be fairly simple. All right. What should good cryptographic hash functions have? They should have this thing called pre-image resistance. It should be difficult to find any input 
that hashes to any particular hash. So if I have my password and it hashes to you know xxy123, then I shouldn't be able to find any other input that hashes to xxy123, mainly because if I am able to generate that hash correctly, the game is over, right? If that's how passwords are checked, right? And then there's this thing called second pre-image resistance. You find a collision for a certain input. So if I knew, you know, this certain input M creates this, uh, this hash, then I should not be able to find a, another input that hits the same hash. And it should have collision resistance. I shouldn't be able to easily find any collision in this hash function. It should be really computationally difficult to make two inputs hash to the same hash. All right, now why is any of this really important? Well, basically, for the first, I explained, you know, if you hit the same hash, the game's over. For the last one, it's kind of interesting. You have to imagine that maybe I'm uh, sending you a PDF that you are going to uh, distribute to all of your clients. And for some reason, you trust me. And I say, oh, this PDF hashes out to this when you run it through, right? Now, if I secretly in my back pocket had another PDF that hashed the exact same thing, and the hash was, new, was how you knew to trust it, then I could just slip you that other PDF, and I could say anything that I wanted to on that. So I can basically change trusted information just because I have a little duplicate in my back pocket that's going to hash to the same thing. So let's talk about some basic attacks you know, on these hash functions. How do people you know, brute force attack um, passwords? This one is called the birthday attack. It looks for collisions. Okay? It's named after the famous birthday problem. If you know the solution to the birthday problem, stay quiet for a little bit. Um, so we have, I think, roughly 12 people in this room. Um, what are the chances that two of us, at least two of us in this room, share the same birthday? Now, 12 divided by 365, right, is about 3%. So is the chance 3% that at least two of us have the same birthday? What about, what about just one guess for how likely it, it might be that, three of, that two of us have the same birthday? Dennis. Dennis, 3%? No? I think it's actually more around 20, okay? So if you have a bunch of people in a room and you have 23 people in that room, it's actually 50% likely that those two people share the same birthday, which is a little bit interesting. Because what it means is if you are looking at random data, right, if I'm going to randomly pick inputs to hash and see if there's any collisions, I don't, need a, I don't need a lot of them comparatively. All I need is enough to make them hit, okay? And it turns out that the amount that I need in order to have a good chance of them hitting is not um, n squared, you know, as many combinations as there are. It's actually n to the power of 2 divided by n, okay? So birthday attack, it's a little bit better than the worst case brute force, which is n squared. All right, some other basic attacks. This one's called the rainbow table. And it attempts to find a target hash while trivially finding the original string and reduce lookup time by chaining hashes, iterating the desired hash, not every element in the table. This one is really confusing to explain in a sentence. But I can show you by example that it's actually not that weird. So let's say that my password is the word Wikipedia. OK? And someone's in the database. Uh, they know that my hash is AO4KD, right? <clears throat> but beforehand, before any of that happened, they created this table. And this rainbow table right here. And what they did was they said, let's start with a list of common inputs. You know, Wikipedia, ABCDEFGH, and password 
right? Let's start with those common inputs. Let's hash them. Let's see how that goes. And then let's actually create another function called the reducer. And that reducer is going to basically, however we like, take the hash, AO4KD, and just convert it back into a plain text password. Hopefully, they convert it back into a plain, like, into a likely plain text password, something that might actually be an English word. So from that hash, we get a reducer to push it back to an English word. And then we just complete that process. Now, what this allows us to do is sort of chain these in a way that allows us to iterate in a, in a, in a sort of clever way. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for my hash, AO4KD. We're going to look for that only in the last row of hashes in this rainbow table. So in that very last row of hashes, we're going to say, is my hash, AO4KD, in there? And we say, no, it's not in there. So what we're then going to do, we're going to run the reducer on my hash, AO4KD, and that's going to reduce it to secret. Right? And then we're going to hash that, and we're going to look for that next hash, 9K PMW, in the last in the last column, right? We still don't find it. But if we run it through the reducer, we run it through the hash function, then what we've actually figured out is, yep, that hash eventually goes through this rainbow table and hits the end. And all I have to do after that happens is say, well, I know that I hashed it and reduced it twice, so I just have to go back twice, and I know that, oh, it was originally Wikipedia. And this is cool because essentially all of the data in the middle of the rainbow table, it is, it is not used for lookups. The only data that is used for lookups in the rainbow table is the very, very last column. And then, you know, when we want to actually figure out where something is, then we pull that row, we get all that information. So, here's a quick quiz. What is a rainbow table attack's least favorite mineral? Salt. Salt? Yes, it is salt. It hates salt. Right? Okay. So, salting one's hashes. What are the benefits of salting one's hashes? With large enough salts, the effective password then becomes unique. Huge problems is that huge problem is that people suck at creating passwords. Uh, they type in password, they type in their first pet's name, they type in all of these really common English or other language phrases. And that's not great because if we see a hash happening over and over again, you're like, oh, that's a common password. Why not take a crack at that? Well, with large enough salts generated randomly, the effective password, because all we do with a password and a salt is effectively concatenate them, the effective password is unique and it's longer. And any pre-computer tables, it's, um, rainbow tables, etc., would have to pre-compute with every single salt. And if your salt is, you know, 16 characters long, that's a lot of possibilities, right? And so here we see just the, um, the flow of how you create a password with a salt and you actually store the salt in the hash, and then when you want, you serve that stored salt back up to the user, and they put in their plain text password with that salt, and everything goes great. Yeah, but what about those juicy algorithms, man? Are we going to get to any of those, like, secure hashing algorithms? Well, I took a look at them. Honestly, I got a little excited. They're not that fun uh, to explain. How did they work? How do, like, for example, how does a secure hashing algorithm one work? Well, it doesn't, right? So I'll leave you with this. On February 2017, very recently, Google announced the shattered attack, in which they generated two PDF files. I explained why this is bad with the same hash in roughly 263 evaluations. 
100 times faster than brute forcing with a birthday attack. And the attack required equivalent processing to 6,500 years of single CPU or 110 years of single GPU computations. So even though it is broken, it's going to take a lot of money if you, you know, want to do a particular uh, Shakur hash algorithm one exploit. Um, but all this to say, guys, stay safe out there. <laughs> don't, you, don't use Shakur hashing algorithm one. And always remember, saw your hashes. Delicious. Thank you. <laughs>